today on the episode I have just myself, no visual nomad. It's a little bit sad, but it's okay. <laughs> I can hold down the fort on my own. <laughs> Anyways, vacations are nice. It's nice to like have a moment to relax. It's nice to be away from the studio. I don't, I don't get that very often. And a lot of times my art vacations are just, um, I guess my normal vacations are just art vacations where I do artwork regardless of where I am because I'm like oh I'm in a new place I'm in a new city I might as well make new artwork I don't know do you ever feel like that do you ever feel like you're you're on vacation but you can't stop thinking about work but when you are creative it's like I feel like it's a special kind of category right you're, you're a creative you are soaking up art and you're soaking up new information and inspiration no matter where you are and so therefore your vacation becomes work although It's like a switch happens in my brain where I don't really think of it as work. I think of it, I'm just like, oh, new ideas are happening. And that feels rejuvenating at the same time. I don't know. What do y'all think? Does that happen to you? A couple years ago, I was struggling with resting and getting myself to be chill and actually take time away where I'm not thinking about creativity. And it was, it was really hard. I couldn't even like visualize the, the separation needed to happen until I was feeling burned out. And then I had a coach and she was helping me like recognize when resting time happens versus when creative time is happening. <laughs> and now every time I'm on vacation, I am like confronted with it. I'm confronted with, okay, am I resting or am I looking for inspiration or am I doing some other things? And I think that is a like huge part of having a creative life. Anyways, I'm doing the episode right now, it seems like, so let's just dive into it. Friends and foes, welcome to Art Book Club. (laughs) My name is Stephanie Scott, and today we are talking about How to Be an Artist by Jerry Saltz. This book, it's a good one. Oh, also, I'm here without Visual Nomad today. She had plans, so we're doing solo book club today, and that's fine. (laughs) But this book was super short. It's very fun. This is like This is one of those books that if I had been given this when I was like in college or maybe even like before college as like a teenager looking to be an artist, this is the book I should have been given because it is bite-sized, very like ephemeral, very like juicy pieces of inspiration and advice, but it's not like, it's not taking you into any deep dives here. And I think that's that's my general perception of the book. So if you want to end the episode here, you can, because that's what I think of the book. But for now, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit more thoroughly through the book. My plan today is to go through each chapter, and the chapters are a single page each. So when I say that there's like 58, 58? Is there 58? Hold on. 59 chapters? 62 chapters. Then um don't be alarmed because it's it's this big, it's little. It's like barely 100 pages. Anyways, one of the things that this this book really re, re-brought up into my brain was creativity doesn't really stop, like, ever. And when you make it your business, that can be an issue. So going back to resting while on vacation, I just spent four days in Arizona visiting some friends. And it's in this little town that's really close to the border of Mexico. And it's like the most peaceful village town. I'm going to call it a town. It's a town. It's got shops. Um, It's the most peaceful shopping, like shopping. Let's try again. It's the most peaceful village. Slow down, Stephanie. It's the most peaceful little town that I've ever been to. (laughs) And it was like, it's such a slow place. Like everything is slowed down. Like the way of life is very like, (laughs) Manana, <laughs> as, as my host would call it. It's super chill and it's super, I don't know, rich with life. It's a desert town because most of Arizona is desert and everything that is planted wants to kill you. It's like spiky things that are also poisonous, <laughs> but, but the way of life is so much calmer than it is when I am up here in rainy Washington, especially in rainy Seattle. I don't know. Every time I go on a vacation, I'm thinking about art and I'm thinking about what it is that I want to make next. And even when I'm not in the studio and even when I don't bring my art supplies with me, like sometimes I do journaling and I'll do little watercolor sketches and I'll do some drawing in my in my notebook. Even then I'm, I'm thinking about the creative work. 
And when you're an artist, it's hard to separate that. It's hard to think about, am I working or am I being rejuvenated? Am I taking this thing that is a hobby or am I taking this thing that is my professional work and bringing it with me when I rest? This book starts out with an introduction that I think sets the tone of the book. It's called How to Be an Artist, right? So this is all about encouraging you to be creative. And I do love that. And Jerry Saltz, who is one of the great art writers of our time, is just like giving some knockout advice here, there, and everywhere. But they're like bite size. They're like fortune cookie size. <laughs> There's this quote in the book that I really liked um, that Jerry says, and it's about how artists are terrific procrastinators, but our creative minds are working even when we're not. The coral reefs and tides of our inner life are still turning even when we're cowering, immobilized, and afraid, and, uh, and immobilized from fear of work. And I think that sets the mood of the book, right? So you pick up a book like this, or it's given to you because you want to be creative, but maybe some sort of fear is standing in your way. And and what Jerry is saying throughout most of this book is that you are creative no matter what you're doing, no matter what time it is, no matter what day it is, no matter if you are actually making something like pen in hand, brush in hand, creating something wonderful or terrible. And um, it's it's kind of it's kind of reassuring. It's like, okay, even if I'm afraid to make something and have the world judge me for it, I'm still a creative person. I'm still making art. I'm still an artist, even if I'm not making a drawing, even though I'm not making a sculpture, because I'm thinking about it. And the way I'm looking at the world is feeding that and it's giving me new ideas. And you're developing yourself as an artist just by being alive. And how cool is that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's huge. It's huge. Hey, Rick, how's it going? <laughs> and um, I think that as like an inspirational tidbit, just like right from the get go, that was like page three, is so... It's, it's powerful. It's powerful, especially if you haven't considered it before. I've thought about this idea in the past. It's not a brand new idea to me, but when it comes to me, it's like, oh yeah. Yeah, that's page three. <laughs> it just it just starts. When the, when the idea comes back, it's just like, oh, right. I am a creative and sometimes it's work and sometimes it's not work. And sometimes when I'm terrified of my ideas or I get rejected, if you don't know, I'm doing this whole project where I'm trying to get rejected 50 times this year. And um, sometimes I take rejections really personally and I'm like, oh, I'm a bad artist because they said no to me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's because my work wasn't right for their specific project and that's okay. But like, I don't know. It's just like, it's it's reassuring to me when I'm thinking about resting, I'm going I'm to continue on this whole resting tyrant, tyrant <laughs> rant I'm going on. <laughs> I'm a resting tyrant. <laughs> um, it's just like, you don't have to, you don't have to like have guilt around not resting because I cannot stop the creativity from happening. And it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have. <laughs> it's a good thing to have like, I don't know, just moments where you get to feel feel the rest happen and still have the creativity happen. Yeah. Hello, Alex. Welcome to book club. Good to see y'all. I can't believe y'all aren't watching the, watching the Super Bowl happen right now. I guess it happens in a couple of hours. Uh, friends listening to this after Super Bowl Sunday, I'm recording this basically right before Super Bowl starts. And I was like, I don't think anyone's going to come to this, but we're going to do it anyways. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I've considered, uh, Alex says, I've considered trying to ask people things that I know will get turned down for the same reason. It's, it's delightful. I've gotten one rejection this year and it sucked. I didn't like it. It was really personal. And I was like, Hey, you want to like do this thing with me? And they were like, absolutely not. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. No, no, actually what they told me, they were like, at this moment, I'm really busy. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> That's, it's almost worse than getting rejected for a date. It's it's next level. Anyways, we are we are applying to more things. At this point, I have applied for nine things. I have not heard back from them yet. They're pending. I'll hear about them in March. So I, I love a, an extended like time between applying for something and hearing back because it's just like I might forget about it. Like, did I apply to that thing? Does it even matter? 
regardless, let's get back to the book. <laughs> this book has 62 chapters. Six, sorry, 63 chapters. And each, the book has, um, I don't know, 129 pages. So it's little. Each, each chapter, quote unquote, is a single page. And um, <laughs> it starts out with this like beautiful image, how to be an artist. We have lots of pictures in this book. Basically every other page is a picture. Um, and it's just bite sized. I feel like this book would be great if you were just like, okay, I need some inspiration. I'm just gonna pick a random page, right? So let's do that right now. We got number 13. Number 13 is, I'm gonna read this for you. Start working when you wake up. Okay. Or as soon as possible thereafter. If you can get into it within the first two hours of the, of the day, that should be early enough to get around the pesky demons of daily life. Four hours is too long, the demons will take you down. If you don't have time to make art until you get home from work or after you put the kids to bed, give yourself 90 minutes. No more to rest, to complete, contemplate, to procrastinate before starting your work. So it's like having space between when you're done work and when you're doing the creative work is they're different if you have day jobs <laughs> and that is the most common kind of artist and yeah so like that's just like one little bit that's number 13 that's page 25 this book is like super short super sweet it has a couple of exercises which i liked um one of them was like let me switch to one we had some images here on the page and it's like all of reclining nudes and each one is like what are Besides the subject matter, which is reclining nudes, what are each of these paintings actually saying? And this is like one of those exercises that you can look at those eight images and you can come up with an answer for each one of them. Like, what is this one saying versus this one? And like comparatively, but this is a question you can bring to an art museum. This is a question you can bring with you to a gallery. This is a question you can bring with you when you're searching on Instagram. Like, I love the, the moments and like little tidbits it gives us of just like slow contemplation and like like really looking and that's super fun <laughs> I don't know it's it's pretty good um it has three main groups in this book let's see we have the steps let me see if it's listed out in the front so it'd be easier to find otherwise I will just hunt them down it does not what happened to indexes I miss indexes okay so step one is you are a total amateur <laughs> and this one is this whole like section of chapters is about things to think about before you even begin making art. So like, yeah, can we bring indexes back? <laughs> I need them. Anyways. Um, <laughs> so the first couple chapters, they're about like, say you're afraid to make anything at all. Like I am a professional artist. I make paintings all day long, as you can see in my studio. It's what I do. But if you are someone who's like, terrified by the pr prospect of putting a pencil on paper like these are things to think about and I loved them they were like here's how to not be embarrassed about being bad at art and here's like what if what to do if you feel like you aren't educated enough and here's what to do if you're like what do I paint about and here's what to do about you know not understanding other people's art and like <laughs> Like, here's what to do when you're like, do I need a genre? Like, should I paint like only still lives or should I do something else? And here's what to do when you're like, how do I get better? Can, can you, can you give me an answer? Hey, how, how do you get better at making art? The answer is um, working. <laughs> right, great. You can pick up this book right now. It's so great. It's like quite good. And it's just practicing so that's the first section that's the first like 25 pages or so and then we get to section two which is how to actually begin i need to like focus my my holding up the book here here we go how to actually begin um this is like instruction manuals for how to like get set up in your studio a little bit more practical but still like still like vague enough that it could be applied to anyone which is cute. I like it. So we have things like start working when you wake up, like I just read. And if you're worried about drawing, just make simple marks. So this one, this chapter, I guess, second part is full of practical exercises. So it's like, try, what do they say? I'm making things up, but let me like actually read from the book here. 
can you make a page full of the same mark going the same way? Can you like doodle a whole thing? Can you make a drawing using only eraser? Like, can you like cover a page in charcoal and then erase out an image? That's super fun. If you've never done that, highly recommend it. It's like messy and interesting and the grit on your fingers on the page feels really good. You'll need a strong piece of paper though, because you can easily rip the page if you're using like printer paper and then you're, and then you're up steady spaghetti. Um, it's, it's good about giving you ideas on like perspective and like making marks. And it's always, all of his like recommendations are using tools that are easily accessible. Like I don't know a single person that doesn't have access to a pencil, you know? Like you can get a pencil <laughs> and you can get a piece of paper somewhere. You could even use this book if you really wanted to and do like a wreck this journal style where you just draw on the pages. It's not actually a sketchbook, but you know what? Nothing is precious. <laughs> and um, it's, it's super fun. One of my favorite exercises that I am wanting to try is making a drawing of some kind. So you want to pick something that is like simple enough that is at, like more more complex than like a sphere but like less complex than a radio right so like a baseball might be interesting or um a like a still life face or whatever and then you do a drawing of any kind you like you do that and then you take that same image that same like motif that you've created and you do it in these styles so after you do your own style you're gonna draw it in a, an egyptian style and then you're gonna do in a chinese ink drawing style and then you're gonna do it in a like western perspective style and then you do it in like a cave painting style. And then you do it like Keith Haring or Kara Walker or Georgia O'Keeffe. So you pick some artists and you try to like make the same image, but in their in their likeness. And I think it's a really fun way to get out of your box and to like really start considering other kinds of art making and mark making. And it's it's super fun. So I, I'm going to try that one <laughs> and I'll, I'll get back to you with the results. Maybe I should do that on a stream sometime. I think that could be kind of fun. This book moves on from doing exercises and thinking about materials and thinking about what to make and how to do it and how to think about your time. And then it goes into following your impulses. This book talks about how you know, you're going to you're going to get once you start getting making, you're going to get lots of like input onto you from other sources and things like that. And it's it really encourages you to like listen to like the loudest voice in your head. I feel like when I was a beginner artist, I had so many teachers and I had so many like they were trying to teach me like their styles of making art, which when you're a beginner, you do need to learn technical skills like that. But at some point, something switches and you're like, you got to listen to like the loudest impulse in your head. So back way back when, when I was doing like equestrian painting, <laughs> I was like doing this because I was around horses and the people I knew that might buy art like to buy horses, horse paintings at least. And like, <laughs> I was like, you know what rich people have? They have horses and I can paint them. <laughs> and, and at some point I was like, oh, you know what? I don't actually like painting horses. I just want to do geometry. And so now I'm an abstract geometric painter because I listened to the loudest voice in my head and I'm making more money than I did when I was thinking about what other people told me to do. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta find out, you gotta find out what works for you and what's not working for you. Another like great point in this book was that you're going to make bad art and you're going to make a lot of bad art. But making the bad art is not a wasted day or a waste of paint. In fact, that it's the opposite. By making bad, quote unquote, art, <laughs> things that are just like beginner or full of mistakes, you are learning. And that is like more valuable than any great finished painting that you could ever produce. When you are learning, it's not wasted. When you are messing up an image, it's not like you ruined your painting even if it feels ruined it's not it's not ruined it's it's pushing you forward in your journey of becoming a great creative person <sighs> you're in that position right now look you gotta you gotta mess up right <laughs> it's like i don't know let me let me read a quote from this one section again the chapters are tiny 
it's just little. They're short and sweet. This is like a book. It's just like eating candy in advice form. There are no wasted days. This is page 51. Your artist's mind is always working, even when you think it's idling. In the studio, even doing nothing can be a form of working. There's also This is also true when you're out walking, traveling, worrying, staying awake all night, whatever. All these things will be a part of your work. Even when you are seeming to be going nowhere, things are happening. You are your method. Your life is part of your work. A bad day is a good day. This is a quote from painter Stanley Whitney. A bad day is a good day because a bad day is when you're trying to make it, you're trying to take it to a different level. It's literally a page. Each chapter is a page. I just, I can't tell you the number of times I've gone into the studio and just stared at my easel and not picked up the paintbrush <laughs> and then been disappointed with myself afterwards just for like not moving anything forward. But sometimes you you need days like that. And not to get like mortalist on you, but sometimes I'm like, okay, well, I could die tomorrow. And today I spent the day not picking up the paintbrush. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm like, getting yourself to acknowledge that even that moment was worth it throughout your life and throughout your creativity. It's like, it's rough. It's interesting. It's, it's, it, it tickles your brain in a way you're just like, okay, even, even the days where I'm not making are still creating and you loop it back to the very beginning and in introduction and um yeah yeah this 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 whole section is good it's also the longest section okay so then after we've prepared ourselves for the studio and then after we have um, started to make art you now need to learn how to think like an artist <laughs> there we go the section it's called the fun part that's what it says right here it's the fun part um, <laughs> this one is about looking at art and thinking about art like an artist because when you when you start making art you are very self-conscious and it's very like beginner and you're very hesitant and there's a lot of blockages that you you have to get through in order to continue being an artist but once you get past those things you have to develop yourself as an artist you have to pursue further thinking as an artist and this advice is very charming. This <laughs> this one is like, see as much art as you can, which seems obvious. You're like, go to the art museum. But, you know, sometimes I don't go to an art museum more than once a year, right? And sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, I should go look at more art or I should go to First Thursday or I should go whatever. And then, you know, I should all over myself instead of actually doing it. So go look at art and go do art as a verb and learn the difference between subject matter and context be inconsistent try new things make your strengths out of your weaknesses the only reason i'm good at making geometric paintings is because someone told me i was bad at it and i was i was really bad at it but now i'm good at it and it took me years of practicing but you know you take your weaknesses and you get better at them and then and then it has things like owning your guilty pleasures like if you like to make a kind of art that you think is cringe or that nobody likes it or that it's like embarrassing you should you should make that one most particularly <laughs> this book talks about leaning into things that are like they like make you feel something you know they make you feel something where it's like either resistant or it's like a fire but you like want to hide it or something like that. That's the kind of art that you should make. You, That's the kind of art that's going to bring out the truth of your work and it's going to bring out your enthusiasm and it's going to bring out so many good things, even if it is quite salacious. I'm just saying, it could be great. <laughs> the last step, which is step four, is how to enter the art world. The subtitle is A, a Guide to the Snake Pit. <laughs> This this section I feel most connected with. I feel like I'm on this step all the time. It's what takes over my thoughts. I'm like, how do I get more involved with things? My whole like get rejected 50 times goal is not just to get used to rejection, but also to have more opportunities for myself and to be more audacious about asking for those opportunities and going for things that I have. I feel like I have no 
understanding of, or not even understanding of, but like no ability to actually achieve if they said, God forbid, yes. <laughs> and it's, it's inspiring. So it starts off with having courage. You know, you do things in your life that require real courage and you have things that, I don't know, it's like you've got your art and putting it out there is terrifying and having the courage to even take that step of like posting your music on Bandcamp or showing your picture to Instagram, <laughs> like that itself takes courage. But then even having more courage of being like, hey, I want to have a solo show in New York City and I want to invite every single person I've ever met. That takes courage. And then, you know, just taking taking a gamble on your your creativity takes courage. And then trying something new after you've gotten used to something or you're like, okay, this thing I've been making sells well and I want to try something else. I want to pivot away from it. That takes courage. Have courage. It feels good. Other things that we have here, I'm going to read some titles out, is uh, don't define yourself by a single medium. I am guilty of this. I've been thinking about this lately. I am an abstract oil painter and I've been calling myself that because it's easier for branding. It's easier to niche myself down there. And I'm like, why do I limit myself to oil paint? Well, one, I love it. I love working with the color. I love the medium. But why not try some other things every once in a while? I have boxes and boxes of art supplies. You can see them behind me on the video here. <laughs> and it's like bookbinding supplies, which I did for many years. I have fountain ink pens with millions of samples of inks that my friend Michelle has given me. And I have pencils and pens and you know, Conti crayons and pastels and whatever. And I very rarely use them. A lot of it is because I have deadlines and I have commissions and things like that. So that's my excuse for not using them. But I'm like, what is my resistance to using them? It's, it's not because I don't like them. I have them in my studio. It's because they are so different than what I'm used to. So that's something I'm working on also. That's something that I really liked from this book. Other titles are No, You Don't Need Graduate School. Uh, I'm not going to explain this one. I'm just going to read the title out, which says, uh, be a vampire from a coven. Uh, except that you'll likely be poor if you choose this as a job <laughs> instead of as your primary hobby. I mean, hobby, just like as your primary way of not making money, <laughs> um, define your success and what that means for you. Use art as therapy. It only takes a few people to make a career. It only takes a few people to make a career. I was I have an interview coming up next week for the podcast, and in it we talk about how one person saying yes to you can make such a huge difference in your life and how it can open so many doors, and that you have to be prepared to be lucky. <laughs> this is a, a little bit of a sneak peek, but if you if you want to have opportunities in your life, you need to be prepared for them to go well. Right. So you need to be showing up and showing your work. You need to be able to talk about your artwork and practiced in that. You need to be able to have the courage to ask for such opportunities and the 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 guts the guts to send a cold email. It's it's quite powerful. I think you're gonna like it. It's with Dree Traffic and I'm so excited for this episode. Okay, anyways. Oh, that's for next week. We'll we'll get back to the book here. <laughs> Learning about to how to write about your work is one of the chapters here. Uh, cuts for cold emails is so huge, Rick. It's like, oh, especially in the music world. My friend Rick here, who is here on Twitch with me, is a musician. And I can't even imagine. Like, I know sending cold emails in the art world is tough. But in the music world, that seems so much more daunting. <laughs> Not to put pressure on you. <laughs> I just, I'm like, well, there Whoa. Um, learning to write about your work is chapter 47 here. This is something I've gotten better at since having the podcast. A lot of the times I will write out my notes per for the podcast before um, not reading it out, but before recording. And it is, it is, it takes practice. And when you feel like you're not very good at writing, it takes more practice than that. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't want to be a mathematician, so I became an artist. And some people are like, I didn't want to be a writer, so I became an artist. 
being an artist requires some ability to be able to write about your work. And it's, I feel like some of my favorite advice to people when they um, are encountering something that they don't like to do, like writing about their artwork, is to figure out how to make it fun. In this book, it talks about making it fun a little bit, but in past books that Nomad and I have read together, especially um, Atomic Habits, that was a good one. If you can figure out how to make the thing that you don't like to do that feels like a chore for your art business, for your artwork in general, and making it an exciting thing to do that you look forward to is, is so key for growing as a creative person, as a human. And I did not like writing blogs about my art. I did not like writing captions for Instagram about my art. And I, I learned how to make it interesting. I learned how to turn it into a game. It's the same thing I'm doing with rejections, right? Can I make it fun? Can I look forward to getting rejected 50 times in a year? That's a, that's a question you should ask yourself if you're feeling resistant to something. Can you make it fun to send a cold email? I'm just going to say that there. Um, there's no such thing as fear of success. I don't know if I believe this, but I'm going to read this one out. This is a chapter, chapter 48. Jerry says, I'm always surprised when I meet young artists who insist that they, they're afraid of success, that it might corrupt their principles or ruin their work, make them lose sight of their real goals or whatever. I don't buy it. Saying that you're wary of success is just a cover story for insecurity, fear of rejection, terror of being revealed as a sham, and the rest of the boring jam that you spread on yourself in order to keep doing the easy thing, which is not work. <laughs> it's much easier to not work than it is to work. Don't take the easy way out or do and, and quit. Just stop pretending you'd work if only you weren't so darn afraid of being successful. It's bull. Hmm. Yeah. In a way, in a way, I don't know. In a way, I feel a fear of success in the in the sense that, like, when I apply for things, especially if they're audacious, <laughs> these quotes are insane. <laughs> if I apply for things, and especially if they're audacious, it's like, okay, I'm afraid if they say no, right? Because I, I want this audacious thing. I want to win a prize or have my art in a big show or whatever. But also, I'm like... I get terrified if they say yes, because it means I have to do the thing. <laughs> and it's not a fear of the work. It's a fear of, okay, so I've gotten to the first step of success, but can I even accomplish this huge thing that I want so bad? And I guess that is fear of failure. So maybe Jerry's right here. Is fear of success just fear of failure? Maybe. Maybe so. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I solved my own issue there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, all right, step five, which is such a great way. And it's it's called it's called Survive the Art World. There we go. This uh this subtitle is a uh, psychic strategy blah 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 blah. Psychic strategies for dealing with the ugliness inside an art. Rick says, uh, let's see, Matt says, that at least it's part of it. Rick says, because fear of success kind of comes from feel, from the failure of not being yourself. There you go. There you go. <laughs> also, good evening, Phantom. Nice to see you. It's so nice to have you all here today. I was expecting to be alone, and here we are. Hey, friends. <laughs> We've got only friends and no foes here, and I appreciate it. Okay, part five. What was it called again? <laughs> Hi. Surviving the Art World. Surviving the Art World. Chapter one of Surviving Art World is you've got to want it. You've got to really, really, really want to be an artist. Have you ever had a moment in your creative, in your creative life, in your creative self, which for some people is like their entire life, but here we are, where you were like, should I even be doing this? I had a moment like that eight years ago. I was at an art residency. Yes, y'all are saying. And um, I had a teacher who was telling me the truth about my work in a way that no one had ever spoken to me like before. And he was really intense. And I appreciate the intensity now. But back then, it was really rough. And I, after he had left my studio, I had, I had sat down and I was like, do I even want to be an artist? Do I even want to make work? 
do I even want to try again? Because I realized then in that moment, the enormous mountain range, the enormous mountain range ahead of me, not just a mountain, but a mountain range ahead of me <laughs> that I was going to have to do all of this work and I was going to have to get so much better than I was currently and that my perception of myself and of my work was just sh wrong. It was just shattered. It was just like, oh, you thought you were an advanced artist? No, you were, you're a beginner still. And not only that, you've been taught so many things incorrectly that you have to start over in many areas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Matt says, I think constantly about, do I actually want to make cosplays? Is it for me? Mm -hmm. um, and streaming, live streaming here on Twitch or wherever. And <laughs> Rick says the biggest moment of that was in 2020. Yeah, it happens often. It happens often. But sometimes there's a moment where it's like a pinnacle moment. And that was that was a huge one for me. And I I sat there, you know, after crying, because you got to cry. <laughs> I had a little pity party and a little cry. And I was like, no, I really, really do want to be an artist. And I do want to improve myself. And I do want to get better. And not only that, I must. Like, like, I have to. And the fact that it terrifies me that I am on, like, the ground and the mountain range is ahead of me and I have to climb all of that in order to get to where I thought I currently was, which I think I'm not even there yet at this point. It's been seven years. I was like, oh, I do want it because there's nothing else that I want as much of this. And if I don't do it, why am I even here? You know, like not, not suicidal here, but like, why am I even on this planet? I can't think of another reason other than to make art. So, you know, here we are. You have know, casual moments like that with your art residency. It's great. It's great. So you've got to want it. And then we have this cute little picture of this person here. Um, there we go. Slamming the uh, blank canvas on the easel with all her broken canvas behind her. <laughs> I love, I love this book. The, the illustrations are so good. Yeah. Okay. Um, other, other titles here. We have Make an Enemy of Envy, uh, Deadlines from Heaven, Learn to Deal with Rejection, A, <laughs> <Hey. laughs> um, How to Recover from Critical Injuries, and, um, Overnight is Overrated. Oof. Overnight is Overrated. Sometimes I tell people who are, like, looking to improve their art, and they come to the podcast because they're looking to improve their work, and hey, I see you, and I appreciate that you're here. And they're like, how do I get better like now? How do I get better? And, and the truth is always it takes a little bit of practice every single day, right? And anytime you see an quote unquote overnight success as art or in the art world, especially, I mean, it's probably with anything, but in art, it, it doesn't exist. And if you see someone who's like a starburst, right, where it's just like an explosion popularity, I feel like in art, and Jerry says this in his book here, it's it's always short-lived. By short-lived, I mean like it lasts for like two years for that person. And then you never hear about them again. They're just like, and then it's gone. If you want to get really, really good at something, you got to put in that daily practice. And sometimes the daily practice is not actually painting every single day, but I mean, it can be that, but it's also like, am I considering the craft each day? Am I thinking about art? Am I getting inspiration, etc.? So like, it's the whole thing. It's not just like, okay, I'm going to get in the studio every single day because that's impractical. You have to rest sometimes. Don't be like Mizaki, you know? Rick says, uh, every now and again with music, I have to remind myself that my favorite artists have been doing it for 10 years before my favorite album came out. Exactly. <laughs> I, I don't think genius exists. I think people might have some talent that helps them get them a little bit further at first, but they still have to work at it. They still have to work at it. It's, it's the same. I don't, yeah. A quote in this chapter here is, art gives its, let me start over. Art gives up its secrets very slowly. 30 months isn't enough. It takes a lifetime to get good at art. It's it's good. Um, another thing I love that he put in this book, because he didn't have to, and this feels good as just a woman, but having a family is fine. You can have a family and be an artist. You can have other responsibilities and be an artist. Uh, I've heard so many times that having children is bad for your career. Um as a woman, but, you know, any, for anyone, having children is bad for your career. And that's just idiotic. <laughs> that's what he says here. It's idiotic. 
it's just, you know, most artists have children. Most artists have a family. Most artists have, you know, elderly parents who need their care. Most artists have all these other things in your life. They're not separate. There's no such thing as the artist who is only the artist and nothing else. Because the hum- the, the, the way humans are, are they have everything. Life just works like that. You have, you have things that don't work out for you. You have moments where you have to have other responsibilities. You have moments where art takes the background and you have to put something else first because that's what it's like to be human, right, on this planet. Yeah. That's huge for you too. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Especially if somebody, like, you know, gets sick or you lose your day job or something else happens. You have a bad breakup or <laughs> someone needs your help and only you can help them. Not to be dramatic, but that, that happens. And... And within that, you can find your creativity too, right? Remember, making art is not just when your pen hits the paper. Making art is not just putting your fingers on the keyboard. It's, it's in everything. Step six, which is the last six. Remember at the beginning of this episode, I was like, there's four steps. There's, there's six. There's six steps. So uh, step six, attain galactic brain. I love it. Cosmic <laughs> epigrams from better hands and minds. Okay, I like I like it. So, um, Pablo Picasso says that art is a lie that tells the truth, and that is the chapter the title chapter for fifty six here. It's you know you just you just you make things. I'm not gonna read that one out. Sorry, hold on, I edit that out later. Hey man, let's just leave it. Um, we have some more quotes here. Let's see. Artists do not own the meaning of their work. Ooh, ooh, this is a good one. Artists do not own the meaning of their work. Okay, I was talking about this to another person the other day, another artist the other day. We were talking about how my abstract art has a lot of like hidden depths and meanings and I know the secrets to them because they're my ideas, right? And I can have a concept and I can try to get someone to feel that concept through the abstraction and the symbolism and whatnot. And yet, I don't... I can't, I can't control what other people think of it. And I can't control what other people perceive of it. Oftentimes at my art shows, people will be like, oh, that reminds me of this. And I'm just like, yeah. And then sometimes they'll be like, that reminds me of that. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, when it's on the wall, when you've never, when you stop putting paint on the canvas, you have no control. It is not yours anymore to perceive. It is the public. When you post it on Instagram, you are letting other people have their perceptions of your work and you do not own the meaning of your work. I think that is so important to remember that you can have as much intention as you like and yet you don't you don't get to get angry when other people have different concepts of what you're making and you don't get to stop people from talking about your work in the ways that they want to. I'm not saying like let people like walk all over you, but <laughs> that's that's something to remember when you're like, okay, I can try to make this as great as to my ideas as I want to and I can write my thesis, but people might not read your thesis. They might just listen to your music. They might just look at your painting and you have to let them because you want to show your work and that's what happens. It's a two-way. Um, da 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 Chapter 59 is uh, what you don't like is as important as what you do like. Mm. Mm. It's good. You know how things have like waves in popularity? Like people will be like, Ugh, painting is dead. <laughs> there are no new ideas. You know what's really great? Screen printing. No, screen printing is over. We like photography. No, photography? I don't think so. We're done with photography. I only want to see paintings. Okay, it like goes in waves. It's it's important to realize that trends happen and that you're going to like things certainly in one point and then you're going to not like things later. And that doesn't make it bad or good for those moments. <laughs> jazz is dead. Nobody listens to jazz anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's it's just... It's interesting. Okay, so I actually like dog-eared this page because I thought it was it was interesting. So when you when you don't like a piece of art, especially like not not indifferent, but when you're like I actively don't like it, this is such a good like range of questions to ask yourself and I 
really like questioning my own taste in things. Whenever I'm getting a critique to someone, I make sure that I never say if I like it personally or I don't like it personally. I'm trying to think of it critically. So here's some questions that you can ask that uh, Jerry has listed out for us. So instead, when you come across a piece of art that you don't like, ask yourself, what would I like about this work if I were the kind of person that liked it? That's a fun question. You can make a checklist of its qualities. Try to spot at least two good qualities along with the bad. What is the work's approach to color, structure, space, and style? Is it craftsmanlike or just craftsy? Is it simplistic? Is it muddy in a bad way? Are the edges mishandled? Are the ideas of line, subject, surface, and scale derivative? Is it too male? Is it too obviously funny? Is it telling you too much? If you find it... Uh, what is this word? Didactic? Di didactic? I have to look that up later. If you find it didactic, define exactly what that means to you. What a work of art should be instead. At the very least, this should give you a working list of your own artistic values. It'll make your artist statement much sharper too. I love thinking about questions to ask art. I love thinking about work critically. I'm going to have an episode coming up about how to critique your own artwork. Unless I already made that episode. I've, I've made so many episodes at this point that I'm like cycling through them again. <laughs> but critiquing your own artwork is a skill. And critiquing work just because like to ask yourself when you don't like something is equally as important. It's like, does this have a sense of completion? Does it have a balance? Does it have a message that's clear? Does it have a message that's muddy? Like asking yourself questions like this will make you one think about your own values, but to think about work in its sense of when it's being made and like it's like in its political realm. Ask yourself questions about why you don't like something, not just with art, but with anything. You are, you are making yourself more susceptible to being open about something, to having an idea and a willingness to interact with it in a way that's beyond, I don't like that. And also there's nothing wrong with not liking something. You're allowed to, of course. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to, like, check yourself. This book ends with a really beautiful last chapter, and it is short and it is sweet, so I'm going to read it out to you. This is chapter 63. Oh, and once a year, go dancing. Why? Because dance is old as art, and one day you won't be able to dance anymore. And that is the last bit of advice from Jerry Saltz in this book. If you don't know this writer, he is one of the great writers of our time. He has been in many magazines. He has written for almost every art show I can think of. I think this man and his wife go to a dozen art galleries every single week reviewing work. You can find his work everywhere in the art world, and I really respect him. Um, recently, actually, like right after I picked this book for book club last month, I saw this video that was showing his apartment. It was one of those, you know, those... YouTubers that like walk around the street, then they're like, hey, can I see your apartment? And then they like, sometimes it's just random people. Then sometimes it's like super famous people. And you're like, cool. <laughs> Anyways, Jerry Saltz did a, a, I guess a condo tour of his apartment in New York City and is just filled with books. There's so many books, him and his wife are writers. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's really cool. So I would recommend checking that out. Yeah. Overall, I've given this book a four out of five stars simply because uh, I took one star off because I thought this book, like when I was reading it, I didn't feel super inspired by it simply because I heard a lot of this advice before. I think this book isn't written specifically for me. I think it's written for people who are a bit younger in their career. Um, not that I'm old in my career, but just like just starting out. And I still thought it was good. Every Talking about it is more fun than reading it, for my case. I was really excited to talk to Nomad about it, but that's okay. We will talk about it another time, because all these like little tidbits are, I don't know, they're, they start a conversation happening. This would be a book I would recommend you buy before having a fun dinner party, and then just like picking up a couple subjects and talking about it over dinner. Like That would be fun. <laughs> that's sexy. That's interesting. Our next book is extremely popular. It's buzzing. It is a book that I've heard so much about. I got it for Christmas this year. And after I got it, four people were like, hey, Stephanie, have you read this book? Um, it came out at the middle to end of last year, I think. Let me look at it. It's enormous. It's like for uh, going from a 
150 book page book to a book that is, uh, let's see, how many pages is this? 400 pages. <laughs> it's pretty different, but the book we are reading next for March is The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. Um, I know I just said it's 400 pages and that's intimidating, but I need to show you that like a lot of the pages are also journal pages. Like, this is a book you write in, okay? Okay, all right. So this book is called The Creative Act. It's by Rick Rubin. I don't know a whole lot about it. This why I, me just saying that people were like, hey, Stephanie, you should, you should read this book. Um, but it's about creating and it's about looking at yourself and it's about being a vessel for creativity. It's got lots of poems. It's got big text. It is going to be a book that's probably pretty quick to read. I think there's an audiobook version of it. And that's what we're going to read for next month. You have the full month to read it, not just a short, shortened days. It's nice. And I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of intrigue it pulls out of me. Yeah. If you want to hear more of Brushwork Podcast, I am on Spotify. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Apple Podcasts. You can also find it on my website at stephaniescott.art. If you've listened to this whole episode, will you put in the comments your favorite art book? Because I want to I want to hear what your favorite thing to read was, because I also need new ideas for future art book club books. <laughs> You'll find Brushwork Podcast comes out every Tuesday, but the next art book club, March 10th, and it'll be fun at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with me today, folks. I'll see you next time. Till next time, uh, make good choices. Bye. See you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>